and I opened it up, and it had the worst cover art on the box. It was just a stupid dragon. I don't know. It was done in third grade by somebody. I don't know where they got them. And then I look inside, and the, and the and there's this saddle stitch booklet in it that was blue. I didn't find out till later. The only reason it was blue is because they could only afford to put one color on the cover. And that was it. And it had dice in it, these weird dice. But this was this was such a long time ago. This is how old I am. This was such a long time ago that the the dice came with a crayon. So you could color in the numbers. <laughs> so you could read them. Yeah, yeah, you have those too. Yeah, I did those. So <laughs> forget couple of dice. <laughs> oh, and they had weird uh, edges. It was terrible. But I read the book and I got it. And I, I became a dungeon widow. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to college at the time. I was, I was taking a motivational psychology class. It was the least motivating class I had ever taken. It was terrible. So I sat in the back and made dungeons. <laughs> Maybe not the smartest thing. Eventually, I, but I, I got the idea. I, I love the imaginative idea. And so, as, as they came out, started coming out with advanced Dungeons and Dragons, so we had to do this, of course. And so we bought the player's handbook. Oh, who bought the player's handbook? Who bought the player's handbook? I bought the player's <laughs> handbook. And when I found this out, I said, darling, you have spent so much money on a book that we now have to find a way to make money on this, or we're going to be hungry by the end of the month. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we bought the player's handbook because it was the first thing that came out and it had numbers in it that made no sense because there were no tables and charts to go with them. We didn't care. I got, um, and so um, in the United States we can get student loans. <laughs> I hope the embassy doesn't mind, but <laughs> it was a long time ago and, and was repaid. Okay. <laughs> yes, I, I bought my Advanced Dungeons and Dragons book with my student loan. <laughs> But it was the best investment that money was put to, okay? Because it got me a career. So, which I think is the point of the student loan money. <laughs> so, um, so we bought our Advanced Dungeons and Dragons book, and that was first edition. Those first edition books were perhaps the worst written rules I have ever read. <laughs> They were completely impossible to understand. Scattered all over. There was no sequence. There was no process to them. And that's what made it really cool. <laughs> because if you were determined enough to read through those terrible rules and understand how the game was played, then you were part of the club. And that was okay. There have been many editions of Dungeons and Dragons since. Some were good, some not so good, some went forward, some went like way backward. Some tried to change the game. Um, there's a there's a rule in the first edition rule book that says and I think it's on about page 97. <laughs> and it says, regardless of every, anything else written in these rules, Who's if you? the dungeon master makes a rule, then that supersedes any rule in this book. 
Now, if you think about that, why did you spend all this money? On <laughs> you can just make something up. I've always tried to keep that in mind. One other little story, because I've completely avoided answering your question. <laughs> we were coming back from uh, the Gen Con convention in Indianapolis. And amazing <coughs> convention. I think there's about 80,000 that come to it now. But we were flying back, and they had just released, I think, fourth edition. Or third edition, or 3.5. I can't remember which one. But they had the new edition of Dungeons and Dragons. And there were three people sitting across the aisle from me who had never heard of me. Okay? And they all had their books. And there was one of them saying, is there some way to make this spell permanent? And, I said, and the other one said, I don't know. I've been looking all afternoon trying to find a way to make this spell permanent. Can you? I'm looking through my book now. I can't seem to find a way to do it. And I listened to them for a very, it was a very long flight. And, <laughs> and getting longer. And we landed in Denver to change planes. And as we were waiting for them to open the door, it always takes forever to open the door. I was standing in the aisle and I looked over at these three men and I said, there is a way to make that spell permanent. And all three of them looked up at me in wonder. I said, really? I said, yes. There is an entire adventure that is written about how to make that spell permanent. Is it out yet? Can we buy it? Where is it that we can find it? I said, I don't know. You haven't written it yet. <laughs> they didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that they had to be creative, apparently, if it wasn't in the book, then why am I bothering? So, to answer, how do I feel about the fourth edition? I, I still play first edition. <laughs> And so everything after that for me is kind of something new to sell. And, and I think that the most important thing in a game is, is the theater, is the imagination, is the story. And what numbers you use to roll the dice, for me, is less important than the joy of creating. Um, something together and having a good time together. Um, Laura and I, we just did a, a, a Kickstarter um, for a game. Sojourner Tales. Sojourner Tales? Yes, yes, very good, thank you. It's called Sojourner Tales. And you can go to sojournertales.com and you can download it and if you want, uh, or you can buy one, we will send it to you um, when we have it made, which is in the spring, we're still, um, but it's a storytelling board game, because we want to tell stories in a game, and it's a wonderful storytelling board game because it uses e-reader, e-books, and so you, once you've played a story a few times, if you want to play a different story, you just download it off the internet, and we even have, and this is the part that's very exciting for us, we even have a method for people to write their own stories to play with our game. And we have people online right now who are out there writing stories to play with our game. So maybe that's kind of like D&D, very, very light, but it gets back to having fun again. And that's, that's what's so very exciting. The, the, the United States Embassy is, has a program here at the library where they're donating e-readers to the library. We just found out about it. We think that's wonderful. So when, when our game comes out, we're going to send one to the embassy, and they'll bring it over to the library. You can play. Anyway, so, so what do I think about it? I think you should use your imagination <laughs> and have fun and play games. If they dare, I know, I just said yes.
Which Dragonlance character do you most identify with? And second, of all the Dragonlance stories that you've written with your goodness, which is your favourite or the most fun to write? Um, yes, thank you. Hey, thanks for your question. Well, characters, which characters most like you? I, am, uh, I actually have a character in the books that is my namesake, which is Lauren Alon Alon Thalassa. Lauren Alon Thalassa, you can't even say it. I have a tongue twister. And so, yes, Lauren is named after me. And so I identify with her. Although I did create Goldman and Riverwind. I, I want to be Sturm. <laughs> I'm probably more like Thanos. <laughs> I come across more like Fizzman. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to, I, I want to be stern. I, I, I try to be stern. Um, the favorite book? I have to think there's so many. Um, Dragons of uh, Winter Night, the second Chronicles book. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no spoilers. Yes. <laughs> oh, no. If you've read it, then you know probably why. But um, but yeah, that one was I think of all of them that was my my. Yes, please. As authors, how do you guys find the inspiration or ideas uh, to write? Um, eBay. I still had to deal with the jet lag, but you know, um, new transporters to deal with the jet lag. I have to think about that. Anyway, um, we arrived here and, and, and we needed to get up and get out, and so we went. Uh, we got up the next morning, and we and, and we know that the best way to take care of that was to get out and go do something, and so we went over to the um, uh, National Museum and started taking a look around. And there was a display in there about film and in Singapore uh, in the 50s, 50s and 60s, film and cinema. And we were looking through that, and uh, we saw a picture in there of um, that, that fascinated us. It was, uh, uh, it was a cart vendor who had a movie theater in cart form. Where they were, where he would, you know, m move it around like a saute cart, and 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 then he had, and it had a little house, and it had a projector on the end, and then he would project into this little house, and it had little windows in it, and people could like, you know, pay money and like look through into the darkness of this little house between the bicycle wheels and watch the movie. And I thought, what a cool idea! <laughs> we have got to put that in a book. So where do we get our ideas? Everywhere. It's a matter of keeping eyes open and, and, and minds open to new <laughs> ideas and, 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 and uh, new ways of, of thinking about, about things. It, it's coming here. It's meeting you. It's, it's you know, going to the movies and, it's in, and especially reading books. Although I can't read fantasy books, but about everything else. We used to read a lot of fantasy. Oddly enough, now we read a lot of history and science. Have you ever noticed how some science actually sounds like fiction? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. 
and, and you can take little concepts out of that and, and, and just twist them a little and they become a lovely fantasy. And, and we've really enjoyed that. And we also enjoy reading biographies. The truth is often stranger than fiction. And I, I read some things and I say, honey, if I put this in a fictional story, no one would believe it. Because true, oddly enough, fiction has to have a ring of truth to it. A biography, well, it's what happened, so there you go. So yeah, we look for it everywhere. We, we, we look for it, and we find it in, in, many, in many different places. We like to take things and use them in new ways. Oh, I'm not sure what we're going to do with that projector cart just yet. <laughs> it's going to be it's cool. Though, it's just right? cool, and we have to we have to do it somewhere. We have um, we have a um, a novel coming out in the spring called Nightbirds. Um, which um, is a gothic, um, what, would you, what, what are we calling it? A dark it? chocolate gothic. It's a it's dark chocolate it's gothic not, kind of story. It's, it's not it's, precisely horror, but. But yes, it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it takes place in, in Maine in 1917, and uh, a, a woman arrives on the train can't remember anything but her name. Um, and it gets weird from there, actually. <laughs> but the only reason that I mention this, other than the fact that it's a really cool book, um, is that uh, when we went to San Francisco uh, uh, once, uh, on a, just on a, a trip, we were visiting um, Fisherman's Wharf, I think, in San Francisco. Pier 53. Pier 53, yeah. And while we were down there, we found uh, there was a museum there of old automatons and, our, and, and old arcade machines from, from like the uh, early 1900s. And as we were looking at all these, all these mechanical people, you know, in, 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 with the, the paint kind of peeling off of them, and we thought, wow, this is really creepy. We got to use this, and so yeah, we, that's, that's coming up. But yeah, from pretty much everywhere. Um, we just like to keep our eyes and minds open. So yeah. Yes, please. Hey, I'm going to ask what role? Because I'm a literature major, right? So I'm going to ask you what role does fantasy play in literature? Like, what does it give you? What does it fill in the in literature in general? Um, fantasy today fills the role of mythology in the past. Fantasy today is our modern mythos. I think more people identify today with Frodo than they do with Zeus. Um, I think for, to a certain extent, more people, many people today, find it easier to identify with um, with the Lord of the Rings than, or with Dragonlance for that matter, than they find in established faiths. The, the role of, uh, uh, as, as Joseph Campbell uh, has, has explained it down uh, in, in his Hero of the Thousand Faces, and we were actually giving a workshop here at the um, at the festival uh, about the structure of fantasy and, and um, its underlying foundations. Um, but one of the things that Joseph Campbell says in his Hero with a Thousand Faces is one the universality of the mythic cycle. Um, it, it's one of the things that makes me believe that we are all united in story. That story is the universal language for us, that maybe the meanings in the stories and what the stories are trying to tell us may differ, but the form itself is always the same. So when we speak in story, we may always understand one another. Um, that, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, and this is something that Laura likes to talk about. But and, and will in just a moment. Um, but the what one of the things.
things Joseph Campbell says is that one of the, one of the problems in modern society is that we have lost our mythologies. That we have become so preoccupied with fact and science that we have that we have lost the the guidance that mythology offers to us as society. The stories, the, the mythologies of our past, and, and very often we, we have a problem with the word mythology because mythology today usually means something that is false. Okay? But in the classical sense, mythology is that which is, is, deals in stories that teach us who we are supposed to be within the community, within our community. What the rules of our community are, what the standard uh, um, ethic of our society is, it helps us to understand on a meaningful level who we are supposed to be and also who we can become. And because of that, mythology in the past, or as I believe fantasy from today, has has the ability to help us to become something more than we are and to understand better who we are in the society in which we're engaged. So, so for me, modern fantasy has filled that void that we feel naturally within ourselves as, as humanity. It's Strangely enough, why Star Wars is so universal. <laughs> because it is so deeply structured in, in mythology. And you have, we're going to also oh. say. Okay. Excuse me. I have. Um, that when we use fantasy to explain things that are too tender or too painful, to address in the real in a real world setting, that it's more acceptable because we're one step or two steps removed from it, and so we can look at something that is difficult from a distance, from you know having lenses, um, and it makes it easier to um, heal. The stories can be used for healing, um, especially in terms of mythology and a community of stories. They're absolutely essential. Um, for people to have a community of stories that they can base um, some of their, um, what would you say, the agreed upon method of behavior in a group uh, is very important. And so um, that's what fantasy can do, but you, it takes it two steps back. So you can actually look at it and enjoy it, but at the same time, receive the information that's in it. When, when, um, um, when Gene Roddenberry first started doing Star Trek back in the 60s, uh, watching Star Trek today, in, in the original Star Trek today is, is a, a little funky actually. <laughs> uh, certainly some of the episodes, um, you know, going back to Eden, Yay, brother. Yeah, it, it's not quite connecting with me culturally now the way it may have done back in the 60s. But his whole point in the 60s in Star Trek was to be able to address contemporary issues from a distance. And in his case, a distance in time. And so, you know, you, you watch Star Trek, and if you take Star Trek in the context of its time, it dealt with race relations. It dealt with um, uh, the, the hippie movement. It dealt with Vietnam. It dealt with a lot of, of very difficult subjects of the time, but it was okay because it was in space. <laughs> the, the message wasn't lost on us. Um, if anything, it, it let us more comfortably approach the world. So, so what role does fantasy play? Well, what role can fantasy play? 
that's the role that fantasy can play in our society. My, if I have a concern about fantasy, it is that it can also be used for harm um, if the author is not, if the author is either unethical or um, unaware of, uh, of the message that they're conveying. So, that's, that's good. Yes. Megan Lance has always been my favorite story since I was a teenager. Thank you. So I'm just wondering, will we ever have a Dragonlance uh, movie or TV series? <laughs> well, we did. Another cartoon. <laughs> okay. There was a Dragonlance movie that was made. Um, it was animated. Um, and it is the best. Dragonlance radio play ever put on a DVD. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you turn it on and then turn around <laughs> and listen to it, it's pretty good. If you're forced to watch it, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Actually, I have, to, I have to tell you something that most people don't know about that. The music was actually so good that one of the pieces was nominated for a Grammy. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Carl Prusser's music is absolutely fabulous in the movie. He was a fan. And so he went all out when he created the music. And the lyrics that were in that song were uh, Elvish lyrics that Tracy had written. And so Tracy and Carl have actually been nominated for a Grammy for oh. the wow. piece of music that was in that movie. But that was, you know, part of what you can <laughs> Another way to think about this is, do you remember the Ralph Bakshi Lord of the Rings? So before Peter Jackson came along and made Oscar-winning movies, it was a Ralph Bakshi film. So I like to think of Dragonlance the same way. <laughs> Before Peter Jackson decided to make Dragonlance, <laughs> there was this other thing that people don't remember very well. But will there ever be? I hope so. I would love to see one. And, and um, Dragonlance is actually coming up on its 30th anniversary next year. <laughs>